Good evening, everybody. My name is Mike Ferrix. I'm your state treasurer. I was asked to come here today to deliver some remarks. Now, normally, I like to open up for question and answers, but I understand that people want to get back to eating and drinking and having conversations, so they told me, don't do that. So what I'll try and do is answer some of the questions I know you already have out there. So to answer your first question, uh, the answer is 6-8. <laughs> See, I, told, I knew some of you wanted to ask that. Was there a pool going over there? So you're comparing, the, did you win? You did, great, congratulations. Um, people ask me, do you ever get tired about talking about how tall you are? And I tell people, I remind them, I lived in Taiwan for two years. If you think that I'm tall in this country, you should see me there. The Taiwanese people were so very nice to me. They gave me free Chinese lessons every day I left the house. They taught me phrases like, Ni Hong Gao, Ni Shi Ji Ren, Ni Da Lan Ma, which mean you are very tall, you are a giant. Do you play basketball? <laughs> in Scout's honor, those are the first three phrases they taught me. Now I come to the States and I tell people I'm the Illinois State Treasurer. And they ask me things like, what do you do? You might be wondering, why is the Illinois State Treasurer talking to the Associated Colleges of Illinois? Well, I tell people I'm the Chief Investment Officer for the State of Illinois. I'm in charge of investing the state's money, to which they'll frequently follow up with, but yeah, you work for a state that has no money. What, what do you do all day long? Do you dust the vault for cobwebs? I will tell you, the General Revenue Fund, GRF, is short of funds. It has a big backlog of bills, about $8 billion in bills, but the state has about 700 different funds for dedicated purposes, and I'm in charge of investing that money while it's growing and waiting for a specific purpose, and that's about $13 billion. We help local units of government invest by pool their resources. We can earn them a higher rate of return, we invest about $5.5 billion there, and we're in charge of 529 college savings plans for the state of Illinois. That's about $11 billion. So we try to invest money to make more for the state. We know that every dollar that we can bring in in interest is a dollar that the governor and general assembly don't have to cut from programs like MAP grants. We know <clears throat> that if we do our job well, we can help make their job easier balancing budgets. That's not why I ran for the office. I'm also in charge of unclaimed property, and I encourage you all at some point tonight, not while I'm talking, but after I'm done, and after the next speaker is done, you go to illinoistreasurer.gov, click on iCash, and see if we have money that belongs to you. We'd love to return that to you. We know when we put more money into your pockets and you spend it in your communities, it does a lot more good for the state than it does sitting in a bank account in Springfield. That also is not why I ran for this office. They were in charge of savings programs, like Secure Choice, helping people save for their retirement, or ABLE, helping people save for their loved one with a disability. Those aren't why I ran for this office. Well, quite frankly, they weren't part of the office before I ran for it. We've helped start and set those programs up. But the real reason why I ran is because we're in charge of college savings programs. See, I wanted to make sure that we had some of the best programs in the country, because we didn't earlier. And I know how important higher education is to giving young people opportunities, and we give young people opportunities to grow and to learn and to become productive. It not only changes their lives, it improves our state. So I'll tell you, when I came in, <clears throat> We manage our 529 programs with outside companies, financial advisors. And I said to them when I came in, you are going to have to cut your fees. How do you suppose these financial institutions responded when I said they had to cut their fees? Any guesses? <laughs> okay, good. I thought I was going to have to use that silence trick. Yes. No! Treasure, we can't do that. You're asking us to cut. We've already cut all of the fat. We have cut the meat. You're asking us to cut into the bone, and the programs can't stand up if we cut anymore. Now, what I said was, because I believe this, I said, you may not want to cut fees, but what else do you want? Now, I've always believed the good Lord gave us two ears and one mouth. 
and we should use them in that proportion. If you spend more time listening than you do lecturing, sorry for any professors out there, if you spend more time listening than you do lecturing, you're likely to learn something. So we listened to them. And they had concerns as well, things they wanted to change with our program. And we found this after about a month and a half of negotiating, they agreed to cut their fees in half. We made other changes to make the program better. And I was very excited that after we did that, Morningstar Rating Agency gave our program a rating upgrade. Let me say that again. An Illinois program received a rating upgrade from Morningstar. I know you haven't used, heard those words used in the same sentence in a long time, so maybe you thought you heard wrong. But it can be done when you work collaboratively, when you don't demonize someone out there. And so what happened was they took a cut in their fees, but we've seen it since then, since we now have the highest rated programs in the country, according to Morningstar, the highest rated programs, we've seen double digit increases every year in new accounts under management and contributions into these accounts. And so although they're taking a smaller percentage, it's a smaller percentage on a much larger pie. They do better, we do better, students and families in this state do better. And this is important to me because I know that if a young person knows they have a college savings account in their name, they're three times more likely to go to college. If they're first generation, they're seven times more likely to go to college. And this is according to research done at Wash U in St. Louis. And it makes sense because if any of you have children, you know that when you set the bar high for young people, they tend to reach for it. They don't always reach it, but they're reaching in the right direction. And so when you tell a young person, I set up a college savings account for you, what you're telling them is, you're smart. You are college material. I believe in you. And that is powerful to young people. Because too many of our young people, too many first generation students hear the opposite. What they hear is, get those ideas out of your head. We can't afford that. We're not college people. And if they can't see themselves going to college, it's hard to work hard in high school. It's hard to have some desire and drive. And so we want to change that. We want to have more families in this state saving for college. We more young people know we believe in them. And when it comes time, when they reach their goal, we want them to have something so that they can achieve their dream. Now, this is important to me. It's very personal. See, I grew up in a household where my parents didn't attend college. First generation to attend college. I'm the second generation to attend high school. My grandparents, all four of them, dropped out in sixth, seventh, or eighth grade to work on the farms. But I had teachers who encouraged me. They pushed me, and I did well in school. And I remember that day when I went to the post office and I saw that thick letter in the, uh, in the post office box. And I was smart enough to know they don't need to waste that many pages to tell me no. So I was pretty excited. I opened it up, I went home, and I said, Mom, Dad, I got into Yale. And I remember my dad's response. He said, good for you, but you ain't going. I said, what do you mean I'm not going? He said, well, we can't afford it. I said, Dad, you haven't even looked at how much it costs. How can you say that? He said, I don't have to look at that. I know we can't afford it because my parents hadn't saved a dime for college. It wasn't on their mind. I was reminded at this point that my father, maybe you've heard the Mark Twain saying, or it's attributed to Mark Twain, that when he was 14 years old, his father was the most ignorant person he'd ever met before, could hardly stand to be in the same room with the man. He left home, went to California. He came back home when he was 21 and was amazed at how much his father had learned and matured in the seven years he was gone. <laughs> the exact same thing happened to me. I went away to college. I went away, spent my summers in Eastern Europe. I moved to Taiwan. And eventually I came back home, and my father had learned a lot. Now you all know I learned an awful lot. What I learned was people had given and sacrificed a lot for me. People had supported me and gave me opportunities. You know, my hometown didn't have a lot, send a lot of kids off to Yale. I like to tell people that, uh, well, how did you get in? I tell them my scores and 
my grades, my extracurriculars. I'm like, well, how did you get in? I said, well, Yale didn't have enough poor farm kids. I was their economic and geographic diversity. <laughs> and I mean that. I mean, I think that helped me to stand out. See, I believe that talent and brains are spread out evenly amongst all socioeconomic classes. But if you look at a lot of our institutions of higher education, they're filled with the children of the wealthy and the affluent. Why is that? Do they have a monopoly on brain power? Or is it finances? Is it setting expectations? And so in the Treasurer's Office, we're trying to change those expectations. I mean, my, my grandmother, when I got in, I told her. My grandmother dropped out in seventh grade. She was disappointed. Why couldn't you go to a good Lutheran college like Augustana or, or Wartburg? I said, well, Grandma, it's, it's not that bad of a school. So we eventually told her, and she went around and told her friends where her grandson was going. Now, I'll tell you, my grandmother was born in a household. German was her first language. And for those of you who speak German, you know that J's are pronounced like Y's. So when she learned English, she used her, pronounced her Y's like J's. And she was so proud to tell people that her grandson was going off to jail. <laughs> jail. And she did that until my mother pulled her aside and said, Mom, when you tell people Mike is going to college, what they hear is that he is going to prison. <laughs> and from that day to the end of her life, when asked, she would tell people that her grandson went off to school in Connecticut. Never attempted to say it again. So um, I know how hard it is and the kind of challenges that first generation students face. It is not easy. You know, expectations may not have been set as high for you. When you get there, you have problems just navigating the system. My parents didn't know how to navigate or they could negotiate on financial aid. I had to learn these things on the way. And so we're trying to make things easier for them. But I know that there are people who helped me along the way. I know this because when I ran for office, this story I'll tell you, my favorite higher education story, I was out knocking, well, I was knocking on doors and I was shaking hands at an event and I met this guy. This isn't supposed to be partisan, this isn't partisan, but I'm a Democrat. He was a Republican on the county board. And I went up and introduced myself to him and I said, hi, I'm Mike Ferris. I'm running for the state senate. He said, I know who you are. I said, okay, well, I, I know who you are too. You're on the county board. He said, I know you. You're, I'm the reason you went to college. Really? It's the first time I've met you. Why, why are you the reason I went to college? He said, well, because I went to high school with your old man. And I said, really? So what, you let my dad cheat off of you on tests? He said, well, yes, I did. But that's not why you went to college. See, my, this Gary here, Gary was the only person in his high school class that went to college. It was a graduating class of about 24 kids, Armstrong Township High School, if any of you know it, super tiny. My dad is a truck driver, he works on construction projects. My dad doesn't know a lot of college graduates. And when I got into college and told him where I wanted to go, and then we had our conversation and doors slammed, he went off and went to go talk to his friend Gary, one of his few college graduate friends. And he drove out to his house, this is according to Gary, and he came by and said, Gary, I just don't understand my boy. He wants to go far away to college. He wants to spend all this money, and it doesn't make any sense. Don't make no sense to me. Gary said, well, I told your dad, well, Jim, you know, college is more important than it was back when we were in high school. And he said, well, I kind of understand that, but I don't know why he wants to spend so much money. And he said, well, college is just more expensive than it was back when we were in high school. And he said, well, yeah, but I mean, there are schools nearby. Why does he want to go so far away? He said, well, Jim, you know, sometimes a young man just wants to spread his own wings and get out of the nest, and you got to let him. And he said, well, yeah, that, that kind of makes sense, but I just think he could stay here and live at home and go to local community college. And Gary said, well, Jim, where, where does he want to go? He said, he wants to go someplace called Yale. Gary said, I looked at your old man and said, Jim, let him go. Let him go. Not everyone has supportive network for them. Some people have more obstacles put in their way than I did. I would like to help remove some of those obstacles. And part of the reason the state treasurer is here talking to you today is because I know how transformative higher education can mean the lives of our young people and giving them opportunities. 
the Associated College of Illinois, I know what a focus you put on helping first generation students. And so I want to tell you, on behalf of myself and on behalf of young people and first generation students throughout this state, thank you. And I want to ask you if you continue sort of doubling down that commitment, realizing the obstacles and barriers that are put in people's ways whose families don't know how to navigate the system and make a commitment because there is intelligence and there is talent that will benefit all of us if we just give them the opportunities for higher education. It makes a big world of difference. Thank you all very much. Enjoy the rest of the evening.